uh, to both Neil and Angela uh, and other people that will join us. Uh, we will start at 10.32 10 uh, so that it gives the opportunity for other people to join um, before we start. Okay, uh, good morning from my side here. My name is Arnaud Meyer. I'm a former president of the Singapore Management University, uh, now university professor and active in a number of other projects and companies. Um, we have an interesting uh, session uh, upcoming on uh, pivoting your business. And it, this is, of course, in the context of uh, the crisis that we all go through um, in, um, uh, in this part, well, everywhere in the world uh, as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, obviously, um, uh, we probably all uh, have a different uh, view and opinion depending on which industry we are in, which country we are in, uh, etc. And I should actually welcome all people not only here with a good morning. I realize that quite a few of you actually are in different time zones, in particular uh, our North American uh, colleagues here. Uh, it's much more uh, a good evening, right, or almost even a good night. Um, we um, we will discuss, as I said, this pivot, pivoting your business uh, issue. And um, uh, from my perspective, uh, what I've seen here in um, Asia and uh, in Europe, which I am more con familiar with, uh, is that we basically see not necessarily yet major disruptions, but we see... Uh, accelerations of existing trends. Uh, there was already before we uh, had this uh, pandemic and the crisis as a consequence of it, there was already a lot of investments uh, in digitalization and we have very capable people on this panel who can uh, look at this but uh, or test give a testimony about this. But what I really see is a rapid increase in this digitalization and uh, this is not necessarily only in the e-commerce field or uh, some of the other uh, uh, activities that we do. Actually, what we are doing here today on this platform is an indication of how we have changed very rapidly uh, uh, in terms of uh, how to organize events, conferences and whatever. And I guess that most of us uh, before a year ago would not have, have even recognized the name of uh, Zoom or in this particular case, uh, uh, Run the World or other applications uh, for um, for uh, events. The second uh, uh, observation that I make in terms of acceleration of trends is basically the, uh, the, the, the quest for more robustness and resilience in supply chains. Uh, we uh, have actually discovered uh, with even banal products like uh, uh, personal protective equipment, how much dependent we were on very global uh, supply chains and that some of these supply chains may have been extremely efficient, but not very robust and not very resilient. And I wouldn't be surprised that we see in the coming years an enormous investment in more resilient uh, supply chains. The third observation that I make is that uh, I see an increased interest in sustainability. And I intended some of the uh, sessions before this one. And I noted, noticed that the word sustainability, uh, uh, taking sustainability into uh, as a decision criteria into your investment uh, decisions, etc., that that was something that has been mentioned many, many times. And I think I'm convinced, actually, that sustainability will rapidly become a much more important component of what we are 
doing uh, the criteria in our decision making. And then, of course, we realize that we have some sectors that will require some very strong uh, reorganization uh, where the pivoting is really necessary. Uh, maybe there, in some cases, it's simply um, an, a rapid increase in the activities that you do. Uh, but I also see uh, in particular that uh, some sectors, such as, such as the hospitality sector, uh, this sector of event management, uh, or um, also uh, uh, the whole sector of um, uh, retail, are probably going to come out of this crisis very different from uh, what it is uh, today. Um, I'm not going to go further into uh, a description of these trends. Uh, I think we have much more capable people in the panel. Um, and I have uh, agreed with them that I, uh, they will be able to uh, take three, four minutes uh, to give their view uh, on what pivoting or rapid acceleration or whatever uh, they see happening uh, in the market uh, to explain what they see. I will go into the order of uh, that was given to me by Horasis, and I will uh, start with Joe, Joe Hirkin, uh, who is from uh, ISU, uh, an omnichannel content tools and publishing platform. Joe, what, is, what do you see as major changes in your business? Thanks for, uh, for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I live in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley, but um, I actually spent the formative years of my career in Asia. I was in uh, Hong Kong and Beijing, working for the Economist Group in the 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, just real quick on, on issue where this massive digital publishing platform that enables businesses large and small from Costco and Patagonia to individual entrepreneurs to make their content marketing materials, brochures, catalogs, um, magazines, newspapers, a whole range of uh, corporate materials, digital uh, across in a range of different assets, to be distributed to a range of different channels, from uh, story formats to the full-on version of the uh, of the piece of content, um, and so we're kind of right in the middle of this uh, disruption and, and transformation. Our, our entire existence is about disrupting the uh, the, the publishing world. Um, Arnaud and I were talking earlier this week, and I, I mentioned him. I actually like the subtitle of this. Um, of, of this session more than the actual notion of pivoting, because I, I think of pivoting as, as uh, coming into play when the technology or your business isn't really working and you have to use it to do something completely different. Um, and I think right now we don't have to pivot as much as we have to be responsive to what's happening around us. Um, you know, I think it's popular right now to talk about COVID and 2020 as being this very specific time of turbulence uh, something that we've never seen before, that we'll never see again. But the truth is, um, you know, if we look at, at doing business in Asia just in the last 25 years, uh, it's been a, one turbulent experience after the next, right? From the, the crash in 97, 98 to SARS to another crash in 2008 to the uncertainty of the Korean Peninsula to the U.S.-China trade war we've, we're still in the midst of and now covid I think the thing that's really important is to remember we've done this before. And while each of these events seem unique, the qualities, the business attributes required to navigate through them are the same. It's ingenuity, tenacity, creativity. And we have to remember it's about the fact that we've exercised this muscle before. Um, and so when we can remember that we've done it before, um, then we'll, we'll understand that this is just one more adjustment in the course of how we run business, in the course of dealing with challenges and, um, and issues in front of us. Uh, I would say right now there are three key areas that I'm spending time looking at. I think they're important to, uh, to focus on. Uh, the first is digital transformation. Uh, and I mentioned it in the beginning of the session. Um, every industry and sector are looking at how to increase digital transformation. Anything that was done in person or with paper is and will continue to move into a digital experience and look for those opportunities in your sector, whatever it is. Uh, the second I would uh, emphasize is profitability. If you are a company that relied on, on venture capital or debt financing to grow, get yourself to profitability. That gives you the most options and the most independence to, uh, to navigate in these kinds of times. We've seen with examples like the SoftBank Vision Fund that funding dries up fast for those that don't have a roadmap to profit. And then the last I would say is, is presence marketing. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, the uh, digital used to just be 
a website. And then more recently, it was about links on social. But in the last two to three years, we're seeing that the web is just one of dozens of channels. You have an opportunity to be, to be present across a range of channels from TikTok and Facebook to Snapchat to Weibo, YouTube, dozens and dozens uh, more are on the way. And so where you're present matters more than anything else. And the ability to have a broad presence beyond what you traditionally have done becomes critically important. And you can leverage all these channels that are out there. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great insight. Uh, can I move to Matthew? Uh, Matthew, coming back to this part of the world, what uh, do you see as major uh, pivots or maybe, uh, as, uh, as Joe said, uh, accelerations of trends, uh, responsiveness? Hi, good morning from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'm Matthew, Group CEO of Shopper360. Um, Shopper360 is a holding company that's listed in Singapore that provides creative and marketing services to our six subsidiaries that operate in Malaysia, Myanmar, and Singapore. So with parts of our business um, essentially serving retail uh, and consumer goods industries, the COVID pandemic has undeniably forced us to accelerate our corporate innovative plans. Um, challenge the way we think about some of our core businesses and in general been an incredibly onerous experience for us. I mean, never before have we worked so hard while making so little, uh, but I'm glad that we have uh, bounced back stronger. Um, and as we look ahead, sort of three areas helps guide and shape our path forward. Um, firstly, it's defining the future of work and consumption. So internally, this involves working towards establishing a perspective and point of view on what the future of work will look like for our organization. Um, and that means rigorously exploring across all aspects from remote working to adoption of new technology to learning tools and beyond. Um, externally within a Shopping 360 sort of context of being in a service industry, um, it applies to not just enhancing collaboration with clients in the next normal, um, but seeking to understand the impact and behavioral change amongst our customers and our customer's customer. Uh, secondly, um, it's essentially find new problems to solve, right? So how do we find new problems to solve for us? Um, once we sort of stabilized the ship, uh, we looked outwards on how we could support the community. And clearly the hardest hit by the pandemic were the bottom 40% of society where, where many were left struggling to meet uh, ends meet. Uh, we discovered that some of our clients shared similar convictions and what was probably one of the, the most meaningful moments of 2020 for me, uh, we initiated a campaign joining hands with clients to provide families affected with food and daily essentials, doing our, our little small part and bringing hope to those in need. Uh, which brings me actually to my third and final point, um, really around embracing agility. Um, it's important to communicate and mobilize grassroots resources from the bottom up as well as from tops down um, to not just survive, but to sustain and hopefully thrive. Um, it is in times like this, uh, a spirit of grit, uh, growth and gratitude, that's essentially how we sort of frame it, grit, growth and gratitude, um, is what will propel us forward. And I'm glad to have the good favor of continually learning and growing with peers, clients and partners through this time of uh, unprecedented uncertainty. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I find it interesting that you say that the redefining the future of work. Have you noticed any changes in uh, productivity uh, in with, with all these new ways of working? Yeah. So, um, so the interesting thing is we sort of wanted to approach it from two different angles. Um, in, it, it, it essentially or initially, because we are six different organizations, the question then is, do you take a group level approach? where it's a standardization in terms of how the overall group uh, uh, sorts of approaches working from home um, and all the different nuances of the current situation? Um, or do you empower the individual companies to make that decision? And I, and I guess in conversation with uh, my, my fellow CEOs, uh, we felt that the latter uh, makes a lot more sense just because of the nature of the business um, in terms of how they conduct where they work from, in terms of how they actually learn in terms of how they actually um, get on board the right amount of training um, and so on and so forth. So I guess for us specifically, um, the approach we took was a little bit more uh, decentralized as opposed to uh, previously what was more a centralized sort of model. 
Okay, interesting. Uh, Philip Dars, um, you are the CEO of Chocolate Moods Media, uh, and I see that you make a lot of documentaries and other things to help people to make a cultural shift. What uh, what shift uh, do you see in uh, in under the current circumstances? Well, the biggest shift. Thank you for the introduction. The biggest shift I think I see is the fact that we've had to relearn everything. And while Joe said that we have been here before, I think we might have been here before, but not uh, to this extent. Uh, perhaps uh, we have to go all the way back to World War II. And I think that this is one of the defining moments of human society or human history, uh, where we have once again had to rethink er virtually everything from a business perspective, you've had to rethink your supply chain, you've had to rethink your productivity, you've had to rethink how you produce things, how you reach your present clients, how you reach new clients. How you've done that uh, is what I've written a book about recently, and that is that it's brought creativity to the fore. I think that uh, if you do a survey of all the CEOs, and there have been surveys done of all the CEOs of major corporations in the world, the one characteristic they're now looking for in new employees above all else is literally at the top of the list is creative thinking. The ability to be creative, to think creatively and to solve problems uh, creatively. And that has been accelerated. That is the one thing that has come out of COVID-19. The second thing that has come out of COVID-19 is that we have finally come to the realization, and again, uh, all I can do is go back to World War II as the last example of this, to think of us as a human family, and that we are so now interconnected that what happens in China, what originates in China, affects the world economy, affects the world's political system, affects, uh, affects the world's social interactions throughout the world. That is going to accelerate. We have not yet come to grasp with the changes that have happened. And the changes that have happened have brought us to a new era of mass instant two-way communications. And that era, you know, I grew up in India, by the way, my connection to Asia. Uh, I'm uh, from India. I'm a Canadian right now, but I, I was born, brought up in India, and I... I still do all my work out of India. Uh, I grew up uh, with, with one-way passive communications with radio and television. And the incredible speed at which we are changing and which the knowledge of the world is now changing. I have read a report recently that said that in the next five years, we will increase the world's knowledge by what we know in entire human history up to this point, that in the next five years we'll have more new knowledge created uh, than we have in the, first, in the last five, ten, uh, human history. And the good example in COVID-19 is indeed the accelerated uh, development of vaccines. Uh, we now have two, at least two, three uh, mRNA uh, vaccines coming up uh, messenger RNA was not very well known or used, and I have been working for 25 years on issues like HIV AIDS and then polio and Zika and malaria and Ebola in West Africa, and uh, these kinds of issues on a mass scale. And I don't think we still have a vaccine for HIV. We, we've been working on it for 30 years. It's also a virus. Yeah, we can keep people alive with antiretroviral drugs, but we don't have a vaccine that prevents it. Yet we will have a vaccine that actually prevents uh, COVID-19 in a span of months. And, and that is a one example of the kind of accelerated uh, pace that we're now uh, uh, facing. And so I actually think that overall, the world will come out stronger and better after 2020. And that actually, in retrospect, we'll look back in history at this year and say that we actually progressed faster than we would have if the year had not happened. Thank you for that optimistic view. Uh, I do share with it a little bit of it. But by the way, I also want to tell you, say that 
we not only miss a virus for HIV, but also for much, much closer to my interest here uh, for dengue, uh, yeah. which is uh, also quite unpleasant. Um, yes. Let me go back to, um, to uh, California and uh, Vikas. Uh, you are uh, from Regalix, a revenue accelerator platform, and obviously you have had been able to observe what lots of sl small and medium-sized enterprises are doing these days. Uh, how do you see the pivot? Thank you. Um, so I've had the uh, privilege of uh, uh, of uh, being exposed to uh, over a million uh, small and medium businesses through the work that we do for brands like Google, uh, Facebook, and Amazon's of the world, and DoorDash's of the world that uh, uh, in turn deal with uh, uh, with all these uh, different businesses. Uh, and uh, uh, what I've observed has been very humbling. Uh, and uh, insightful. And I'll take one very small business as an example and, uh, and narrate that story and uh, draw some learnings uh, that I've personally taken home uh, by observing uh, one as a sample amongst uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of businesses that we uh, are exposed to. So this is a very small uh, cleaners business. Uh, uh, where uh, a set of uh, uh, maids would go to different house, uh, homes and uh, do the cleaning, uh, provide cleaning services. Uh, it's a very, very small business. Uh, and uh, uh, when uh, COVID and the lockdown started in March, suddenly the business was, uh, uh, it, it came down to zero, pretty much. Uh, nobody was uh, requesting cleaning services. This is just an example. Many businesses went through something very similar. Uh, but uh, I'll just take this business a little further. Uh, what uh, uh, the business owner did was uh, she refused to give up and said, amongst all my customers that can look after themselves, I have two homes that I serve, which have uh, uh, elderly ladies who do need my help. And I don't uh, care uh, what uh, is going on. I'm going to provide help to them. Now, you provide help by being uh, prudent in the current situation. So the first thing she did was uh, uh, go through a COVID test herself and uh, through uh, all the uh, assistants that uh, worked with her, uh, made them go through the same set of tests uh, got them to understand the severity of this and what precautions they need to do if they need to continue uh, uh, working in the current uh, environment. The second thing that she did was uh, uh, go to the homes that she had picked up uh, that needed help and uh, and uh, decided uh, and uh, got the ladies uh, the help they needed through the testing and whatever to make sure that uh, they were uh, also... Uh, risk-free and uh, uh, she wasn't doing this for money at that time uh, knowing fully well that she may or may not get uh, paid for uh, but she saw this as uh, uh, as a purpose-driven uh, effort of what needed to be done uh, and uh, and she did that now the ladies themselves uh, used to pay uh, for the service uh, previously by cash but uh, the uh, but there was no cash because they have not been able to go to banks and withdraw money uh, for several weeks and months and uh, and uh, uh, but this was okay uh, she was okay not uh, taking money for some time uh, and continuing with uh, with the service uh, then uh, she uh, started, uh, uh, got the ladies to download uh, Messenger on their phones, taught, taught them how to use it, uh, WhatsApp, and uh, so that they could coordinate with uh, them for uh, when they needed help. Uh, now, I'll step back and start, uh, I'll take this example and continue with uh, what uh, the broad uh, uh, thesis of what learnings uh, that I derived. And as I have looked at uh, hundreds of thousands of businesses, uh, having gone through similar pivots and similar 
adaptations, what they have gone through as well. So the first thing that uh, I learned from this is uh, purpose and cause. You need to uh, be passionate about what you are doing, which is larger than yourself. It doesn't matter whether, uh, uh, so that purpose needs to drive what you are doing. That, that's the most important thing. And uh, businesses that have uh, succeeded have uh, really learned and took that to heart or discovered or rediscovered that for themselves. So in this case, what she discovered was uh, her passion of helping uh, people who needed it the most. The second piece was empathy. Empathy is equally important. And, uh, and the application of empathy was not only for herself or for her customer in this case, but it was also for her employees and other partners that I'll get to uh, as the journey continues. The uh, so empathy all across and rounded is the other one. And it kind of naturally uh, is, is a natural evolution if you really are uh, driven with purpose and cause. The third piece was to create a plan and execute against the plan. And the plan, very simply, is a short-term plan, what you need to do in the next 30 days. And then what do you learn from what you're doing that have tenants for longer term business model applications and put them into a long term plan context. And the yeah. fourth was how do you start using technology and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, digital, uh, uh, digital technology that are at, at your disposal and uh, use them creatively, creatively to, uh, uh, to create newer, uh, models of doing this now what uh, another minute or two yes I, I need to interrupt you because i would like to move to Yatsio, uh to give him uh, but these four points are very interesting purpose empathy create a plan and execute and uh, how to use technology interesting uh, observations uh, we can come back to that in a but i w want to give Yatsio the, the the opportunity to say a few things here uh, from his perspective as ceo of a uh, 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 Animoca brands, uh, basically uh, working on blockchain. From your perspective in Hong Kong, what do you see as major pivots? Uh, thank you. Yeah. So I guess quickly. Uh, so I guess we're, you know, as you mentioned, we're a video game company that's actually really focused on blockchain gaming. Uh, the mission is to deliver true digital ownership, i.e., property rights, and digital assets. And I think due to COVID, that trend has accelerated quite significantly uh, because of the fact that more people are spending online. And maybe the first insight here is that, um, you know, we've seen, uh, if it was a blip for just one month, then it might just be, you know, an experience that people move on. But because it's become consistent, uh, uh, playing games uh, and spending time online has become really a lifestyle habit, right? So people don't necessarily hang out anymore by just meeting up in bars and restaurants, but they basically actually meet up virtually online. And social lives have moved online. So video games have become social platforms as a whole whether you look at companies like Roblox or ourselves or Sandbox or whichever. Uh, so it's increased that. Um, traffic volume has also gone up about 75% overall. Uh, and you can see the demand you know, externally with like demand for PlayStation 5 or Nintendo hardware. I mean, it's also kind of flying off the shelves. In fact, there's, not, there's just too much demand. Um, now, what does it mean really? We think what it means, and this is what area we're focused on, is that actually video gaming and virtual worlds, broadly speaking, um, is going to be um, the future of work. Because right now, for instance, in our own sort of uh, virtual world environments, um, uh, growth has exploded. We've seen about 250 million US dollars worth of trading of the digital tokens in just the month of October. Uh, people are making about, um, you know, between 1,000 to 1,500 US dollars a month in income, you know, playing our games, as it were. Uh, as, as well as uh, people like in the Philippines are making about 600 US dollars adding value to the virtual assets. And that sounds a little bit strange, but the main thing here is, is that when you think about labor forces, normally labor forces are limited from going from one location to another because you have to go there, right? You have to take an airplane, you have to take a boat, but in the virtual world, you can actually just service them anywhere where you are, right? So there's definitely one, one benefit. So I think developing countries are, are the people who know, and you just really need a phone or you need a computer, and your internet access. So, so that's an area that's really accelerated. Um, and I think the, the other thing is a millennial change as well. 
uh, the the Gen Z or millennials, you know, do they value the virtual life more or the vir- or, or the or the or the physical life? Right? Uh, you know, is it more important to have many followers on Instagram or to be seen, you know, at a famous gala? Right? Uh, these are things that 20 years ago were very different from where they are today, and so value has attributed to your virtual identity. And um, because of blockchain, uh, these assets become permanent and true. Right? So blockchain acts as a um, as essentially a government almost. Right? It's it's governance uh, to ensure the, the that these assets are truly owned by you. Why is Bitcoin or Ethereum on the rise? Not just because people are concerned about the U.S. dollar, but because also, actually, I own this digital token, right? and nobody can take it away from me because it's validated across millions of nodes. No central organization can remove that. So we think it actually also creates a new, broader sort of um, uh, I call it sort of capitalist democratic setup through through blockchain technology, which I think um, may actually completely change the way we look at commerce and trade. Uh, perhaps in the next five to ten years. Interesting. Uh, um, in fact, when I listen to the five of you, uh, one thing that emerges, there is several interesting things that emerge, but one thing that emerges is that the nature of work is going to change quite considerably. I heard Matthew mentioning this, uh, that uh, uh, the, 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 he was talking about the defining the future of work. Um, uh, Vikas was pointing out how people, even in very small businesses, can completely change the way they work. Uh, Philidaus was pointing out the the explosion of knowledge and the need to uh, be much more creative in thinking. And then uh, Yatsio was uh, referring to the fact that actually our labor force is actually becoming global and uh, that uh, there are less uh, less borders uh, and that you can work from anywhere. Any further comments on this idea that work and jobs are going to fundamentally change? Is there anybody who wants to t- interact on that? Joe, you have any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we're. I think the way in which most companies are now operating and working was generally inconceivable a year ago. Um, you know, you look at a company like Google, who was putting massive investment into buildings in uh, all over the world, actually, where they were going to be bringing people together and. Uh, we're, we're now seeing a uh, huge investment in people working remotely and working from home. Um, and so I think what we're, what we're starting to see is a shift. But in order for that to happen, it actually creates a lot of opportunity from a business perspective. It's one thing to say it. You can work from home. You can work remotely. It's another to make sure that there are the mechanisms of, uh, of management of, uh, of people differently now than uh, most businesses had been set up for uh, previously. Um, there'll be ways in which to, you know, new software is going to be developed. Uh, we're going to start to see increasingly, you know, people are going to use their phones as a core mechanism for uh, for work. So it gives uh, a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of who you're hiring and where. It also comes with it a set of responsibility and accountability that, Businesses need to be putting in place uh, to provide the right the right tools for real, um, so that people can be effective. And and, and there's going to be challenges around uh, effectiveness and uh, management and all those sorts of things. That that's going to be one of the challenges we'll see. It will get worked out, but there'll be um, uh, there'll be conflict there. Firdaus, any comments on that one? Yeah, I would like to add actually to that, which I think is uh, echoes uh, my own thinking. I think that what we need to have CEOs and leaders of organizations and even political leaders, economic leaders focus on is an organizational uh, uh, structure, the culture uh, within an organization. It doesn't really matter uh, what the organization is, but from the top down, they have to have a focus now on innovation. And if you have a focus on innovation, you have to now think about how that innovation is going to come about within your corporation or within your organization, because it's going to be quite different. In the old days, you might have put five people in a room for a couple of days in a workshop or go off to retreat somewhere or something like that. But now you have to drive innovation in your company, even though everybody is remote, even though everybody is not interacting physically 
with each other. So the way that the organizational culture uh, is going to change within organizations and the way innovation appears and comes to the forefront within an organization is going to change. It is going to be a much more mental process rather than a physical process, uh, regardless of what the product is that you're finally going to uh, invent or, or create or come up with. And that means things like creative freedom are going to become much more important. Risk-taking and the ability to fail within an organization is going to become much more important in the future so that uh, the organizational culture must allow people as individuals to fail uh, in order to get to where they need to go, which is to innovate and to come into the new world. And that will change considerably if people don't come together physically. The old ways of taking an idea and then interacting uh, with the person who came up with the idea and then can, you know, massaging it and concluding it and coming up with a new product or a new process or a new way of reaching uh, your marketing or whatever is going to completely change. Uh, Matthew, actually, in line with what, uh, what Firdar said about innovation and how things are going to change, you uh, raised an interesting point that I wrote down here. We have, in order to serve your customers, you will have to find new problems to solve. And do you have any further information or further comments on that? Finding the new problems to solve, which is a bit that, that same idea of innovation, right? Yeah, I, I think for us, because we work largely with retail and with uh, consumer goods products, um, it's really understanding our customer's customer. Um, and so our customer's customer is essentially the shoppers and the consumers, right? Um, and it's really getting down to the basics of understanding the shopper and consumer behavior and how that's starting to shift, right? So hygiene standards have gone up. Uh, people are learning how to stay fit physically while also being very mindful of their mental health, right? So awareness of mental health is incredibly important. Uh, people are going back to the basics. People are learning how to cook. Um, In-home consumption is going up. So that's a very interesting trend for um, a lot of the clients that we work with. Um, how do we capitalize on some of these sort of shopper and consumer trends as they start to shift? Um, and that's how we're starting to sort of approach it, trying to think on behalf of the client and how can we, how can we look towards solving or finding new problems to solve? Do you have an example of a, a very concrete example of that? Or is that uh, too indiscreet? So, for example, um, Right now, in Malaysia in particular, uh, when people go out to shop, uh, given the current lockdown scenario that we're in, uh, very, uh, only one or two people are allowed to actually go out uh, and, and make a purchase. Um, the typical process for them to go ahead and do that is, obviously, you need to wear a mask, you go out, and you reach a, a grocer or a supermarket, you need to queue, and it's social distance, so obviously, you, you, you stand in a long queue. Um, when you reach the front, you take out your phone, you need to go and stand, right, to mm. enter uh, the supermarket. And given all the time that's being spent sort of preparing, going, waiting, the amount of time that you actually spend in store becomes very, very little, right? It's, yeah. it's almost been shrunk, right? So how we work with clients, instead of sort of placing all of their goods where they used to place it, in their home shelves and right at the back of hypermarkets, given the fact that People have so little time, they just want to go and pick stuff up. We work with them to reposition some of their products um, in places that are a lot more convenient, right? So people are going to stores, picking it up, and quickly dashing out, right? Because the amount of time being spent right now, as opposed to putting aside purchasing on e-commerce, the retail experience is so disrupted right now. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Vikas, um, uh, I like to see your idea of purpose and empathy, uh, which sort of brings back the human element uh, to, uh, of course, there is technology that supports, but uh, I thought it was great that you sort of remind us that in the end, this is actually why do we do this and how do we have that empathy? Any further comments on that and uh, that you that you observed? Um, sure. I mean, uh, we were, uh, we had a task uh, where uh, we had to take uh, a few thousand people uh, are employees uh, to work remotely pretty much overnight mm -hmm. uh, when uh, this uh, and, and uh, do that globally and uh, much to my surprise 
uh, we were able to do this within three to four days where okay. we took uh, several thousand employees globally, had all of them to work remotely uh, with zero interruption in uh, work uh, through this process. And, uh, and uh, on top of it, uh, uh, the productivity uh, that we saw actually increased overall. Uh, uh, quite significantly. Uh, so it was a very humbling experience to see something that in a normal course would have required months and years of planning to implement that uh, was shrunk with uh, very little uh, disruption and increase in productivity in the same window. Yeah. Uh, and part of my learning was uh, this was approached with uh, a lot of purpose where people uh, thought that uh, what they were doing had an impact on uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, businesses that relied on the work that they were doing. So the purpose was there and uh, the whole transition was dealt with a lot of empathy. Thank you. Great, a great example. Uh, Yatsuk, let me come back for the last few minutes that we have to you. Um, you're, of course, in a business that has benefited enormously from the uh, COVID-19 Questions that I always have is, uh, have you been able to cope with it, with the growth, uh, with the demand, with the, and how do you do it? Uh, how do you ensure that you actually can take advantage of this, this opportunity? Well, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I guess as the saying goes, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's luck involved as well, right? And so I think, um, you know, clearly we were maybe prepared for it as others are, but not expecting a pandemic, right? And I guess nobody's hoping for something like this. Uh, I think the, 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 maybe the best answer to this is growth in itself. I think everyone here is capable to handle fast growth. I mean, the businesses here are not startups. Um, uh, we're, we're certainly not one, so, so the infrastructure is there. You're not hearing about sort of game servers around the world crashing or, you know, um, we, don't, we don't have 5G, but still 4G is working fine for all of us, right? We're still able to communicate broadly. Internet's working, broadband's there. So I think the technical roadmap is there. Uh, to me, the interesting thing is around sort of what can we do to actually help um, sort of uh, not just lessen the burden, but actually bring about new opportunity. And I think uh, we always felt uh, that virtual worlds, uh, as in, so you look at things like Second Life, you know, 10, 15 years ago or so on, they've already shown an early form where you can make real income and actually perhaps uh, live a sort of a meaningful life in the virtual context. You could argue that that's already happening indirectly, but with one big difference, which is that all the benefits of the data that goes there is centralized, uh, meaning that you have, you know, the, who are the beneficiaries of this? Well, it's single entities, really. It's like Facebook, it's, it's maybe Amazon, it's Google, right? because they own all the data, right? And we willingly give it to them without actually giving it a thought as to what that means. But just like a country, they, these, these large technical sort of technology companies are dictators, you know, maybe benevolent, but they are, right? The benefit only goes to a very small select uh, few. Uh, and for any change, um, even if you look historical, to sort of grow and have inclusion, you need to have more people in, be included in that ecosystem. Right? Like, you know, capitalist democracies as, as a good example, right? Mm -hmm. the, breakdown of the, feudal, the breakdown of feudalism to, you know, true property rights is, is one such example, right? And the birth of all that and the innovation that came from that. And we think the di digital world, broadly speaking, is in need of that as well, right? The inequity we see right now come, comes from that. And so I think... Blockchain is that because it is not owned by a single entity. It's owned by the community. Uh, and uh, virtual assets uh, in, in what's being built here around true digital ownership, we think, will truly change the world for the better. Thank you for that. I um, run the world tells me we have 24 seconds left, so it's basically over. Uh, lots of great ideas. Uh, I will not repeat everything, but I do uh, I mean, sort of pick up from Joe that we've been here before. We've had uh, other uh, adjustments to make, but this may be a much bigger one, as Firdaus was uh, explaining. Thus, we need probably a lot more creativity and deployment of information. Matthew had a great idea about it is about finding the future of work and new problems uh, to be solved. Um, and Yatsu, well, apart from uh, promoting uh, blockchain, but also 
sort of showed us that labor forces uh, have become a lot more global. And then finally, Vikas, uh, this combination of purpose, empathy, create a plan and execute and how to start using technology is a great uh, uh, idea about how to do the pivot. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your, well, actually only gentlemen on the panel, I have to say, but ladies and gentlemen in the audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, gentlemen on the panel, uh, great, uh, great, some great ideas. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, bringing them here to the panel. And I wish you a great and a very good day wherever you are and an uh, interesting uh, Horaces conference uh, uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, to our audience.